American exceptionalism comes to the NES on this 26th episode of Good Intentions. A common thread that ran throughout the first 25 games we've looked at so far in Good Intentions is that each and every one of them was developed in Japan, originally for Japanese audiences. Certainly Nintendo curated the NES launch library for American tastes, which is why we got Ten Yard Fight instead of Mahjong and Mock Rider instead of F1 Race. Still, even games created by Nintendo with the US market in mind, such as Stack Up and Gyromite, debuted in Japan. But here, at the very end of the second wave of NES launch titles in June 1986, we finally have a game that breaks the pattern, Gumshoe. Designed by the incredibly busy Yoshio Sakamoto, who also led development on Balloon Fight, Gumshoe is the fourth game specifically designed for the Zapper Light Gun. Like Hogan's Alley, it wasn't based on any existing Nintendo property from their pre-video days, it was an entirely new creation. Unlike Hogan's Alley and every other Zapper title we've seen so far, however, Gumshoe was no mere shooting gallery. While it involved pointing and firing the gun at the screen, and even involved some vaguely familiar elements like blasting tin cans out of the air, this was a completely new and original application for light gun technology. In fact, I can find no previous light gun game that works even vaguely the way Gumshoe does. This is Nintendo R&D 1 at its weird best, taking a proven technological concept and just going nuts with it. So here's the breakdown. Gumshoe is an auto-scrolling 2D platformer in which you take responsibility for the eponymous detective, a former FBI agent by the name of Mr. Stevenson. Mr. Stevenson has to rescue a video game damsel in distress, not his lady love, but rather his daughter. A cruel mob boss by the name of King Dom, yeah, has abducted poor Jennifer and refuses to return her to the detective unless Stevenson tracks down and hands over five legendary diamonds. Okay, the plot is no great shakes, but the game feels like a crazy rough draft that predicts several video game trends that would come into sharper focus 5, 15, even 25 years later. You'll notice that I said players take responsibility for Mr. Stevenson, not that they control him, and that's because you don't have any direct control over him. Rather, he marches forward inexorably, heedless of danger. Your task is to guide, guard, and direct him like some sort of holy spirit with a neon orange light gun. As the game plays entirely with the zapper, your only control option is, well, to shoot Mr. Stevenson. He's a tough fellow though, and blasting him simply causes him to leap into the air. And that's essentially the game. Mr. Stevenson advances through a fairly standard scrolling 2D platformer world, one packed with goodies to collect and hazards to avoid, and your only control over him is to cause him to leap. His jump allows him to clear gaps and avoid deadly hazards, and you can blast him consecutively to make him double jump, triple jump, or just hang in the air. You can also shoot things out of midair to protect him, though not all hazards are vulnerable to zapper fire. From this simple setup, one of the most interesting and innovative light gun games ever made emerges. It's not necessarily a great game, in part because it requires a level of precision fire that most people find incredibly difficult to pull off with a zapper. I've made many swings of this game over the years and still can't seem to get past the first level. The tiny hazards that come flying in at high speeds from off screen, combined with the need to split your focus between making the detective jump and gunning down hazards, makes it really tough to keep everything in your sights. Worse, hazards on the lower portion of the screen tend to be obscured by the zapper butt in your arm. If not for the game's attract mode, I'd have no clue that Gumshoe features a variety of stages. Still, irrespective of its quality or accessibility, you can definitely appreciate that Sakamoto and his team were seriously spitballing some crazy ideas here. I mean, look at all the games that Gumshoe predicts. The idea of characters who can't be controlled directly, only influenced, surfaced right around the same time as Gumshoe and David Crane's Little Computer People. It's entirely possible that game helped inspire Gumshoe. But Little Computer People was a sort of virtual aquarium in concept, allowing players to act as voyeurs on a tiny person in a tiny cutaway digital dollhouse. Gumshoe was an action game through and through, fast-paced and constantly challenging. You wouldn't really see that idea take off until DMA's Lemmings, five years later, a game where players could influence but not directly control an army of tiny creatures trying to make their way through tricky puzzle-like challenges. Another reasonable comparison might be something like Pac-Man 2 The New Adventures, which had a more methodical pace but involved more hands-on, albeit still indirect, interactions with its main characters than Little Computer People or Lemmings did. And of course the idea of a forced scrolling action game took off in about 1984-1985. I've mentioned Irem's Moon Patrol quite a few times already in Good Intentions, but it really bears mentioning again for the way it grounded the side-scrolling shooter established by the lights of Scramble and Defender, completely changing the nature of the game in doing so. 
By limiting players to driving and jumping, Moon Patrol created a severe restriction of play design that felt absolutely different in nature from the free 360 degree movement of a proper space shooter. Around the time Moon Patrol debuted, Namco gave us Pac Land, which wasn't strictly auto scrolling but definitely had much the same feel. And 1985 gave us the likes of Sega's Flash Gal and Namco's Metro Cross which absolutely did add auto-scrolling elements to games that typically would have granted the player more agency over their movement. Gumshoe feels in many ways like the next step of evolution for games like these. And in that sense, it stands as another forerunner, if you'll pardon the term, to the endless runner genre. But this isn't another case of, oh yeah, they are kind of alike, huh? Gumshoe literally is the blueprint for Flappy Bird. But don't hold that against it. You can also see a lot of Gumshoe's DNA in Donkey Kong Jungle Beat. That's a 2D platformer that breaks from the typical format of the genre by tying the action to a completely alien interface device. Unlike Jungle Beat, though, Gumshoe didn't get anyone a job making the greatest Mario game of the past decade or so, although Sakamoto's next project would be Metroid, so I suppose there's something to be said for that. No, Gumshoe has no real legacy to speak of, and that gets back to the fact that Gumshoe debuted in the US unlike any other NES launch game. It debuted here on a technicality, as it turns out, as Nintendo never released this game in Japan. Over the next six or seven years, Nintendo would produce a number of US exclusive first party NES games, most notably Star Tropics. And as with all of those games, they have almost zero visibility in Japan, the market to which Nintendo caters first and foremost. But even Star Tropics and its sequel at least get reissued from time to time in the West, something that takes a bit of doing as those games run on a unique mapper chip that tends to be fairly difficult to emulate properly. Gumshoe, on the other hand, goes down with other US and Europe exclusive first party light gun games like Barker Bill's Trick Shooting and To the Earth, their lost time, and to Nintendo's disinterest in going to the trouble of resuscitating niche games no one in Japan knows about, all for a derelict accessory. Still, even if it's crazy difficult and essentially unplayable these days without going to tremendous effort to source the requisite tech, Gumshoe holds a special place in the NES library. It was the first sign that Nintendo's interest in the US went beyond a backup revenue stream for its Japanese releases. Here was a game made exclusively for America and Europe. And not some dumb piece of shovelware either, but a repository for some genuinely inventive game concepts. I mean, I guess it's also possible that Gumshoe was originally designed for the Japanese market but deemed too shoddy to release there, so we ended up with table scraps, but I prefer to take the positive view. And with Gumshoe down, we've hit the end of the two-phase NES launch lineup. From here on out, things will be different. Sometimes for the better, sometimes not. Please look forward to it. <laughs>